when we think about the Buddha's teachings on karma, we most often think about how it applies to the results of our words and our deeds. And we tend to forget that it also applies to the mind. In fact, it applies primarily to the mind. Our ideas are instances of karma as well, the things you focus on, the things you choose to think about, the questions you choose to ask, the perceptions you choose to hold in your mind. These are all actions as well. And they all fall under the, the Buddhist teachings on karma. There are skillful actions on the worldly level. In other, words, in other words, there are skillful ideas that help you live in the world in a happy and pleasant way. There are unskillful ones that make you live in an unpleasant or unhappy way. There are mixed ones, and then there's the ideas that take you beyond ideas, take you beyond action entirely. Those ideas are the ones that are related to the Noble Path. Right view, right resolve, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These are all instances of karma. And so when you let your mind dwell on something, ask yourself, what is the result of dwelling on this? In other words, the question is not only is this thought true, but also is it useful? Is it going someplace well, taking you someplace well? What are, what, what's its impact? And if you see that if it's not only true but also useful, then there's the question, well, is this the right time for it? Those questions that the Buddha has you ask about right speech, they apply to your thoughts as well. You can see this as you, as you meditate. We talked last night about the perceptions you have of the breath energy in the body. It's come down to three technical terms. There's attention, there's intention, and there's perception. Perception is the mental picture you hold. In this case, you can. What picture do you have of the breathing process? When the breath comes in, what's coming in? How is it coming in? What's making it come in? Have you stopped to examine that? One way to examine it is to give yourself a new perception, consciously, intentionally. Think of the body as a big sponge. It's got holes all over the place, and the holes are connected. So when you breathe in, breath energy comes in from all directions, and there's nothing really in the way. There's always a hole someplace that it can come through. And just hold that perception in mind. And see what you start noticing. How it changes the way you breathe, whether it's more comfortable or less, whether it's easier to stay with the body or harder to stay with the body. That shows you the, the karma of your perception. It starts having an impact. They're either comfortable feelings or uncomfortable feelings. You can think of the breath as subatomic. Excuse me, as subatomic. All those spaces between the atoms in your body. That's even more open than a sponge. More refined than a sponge. And John Fu used to recommend thinking of a, there being a core running down from the brain down to the bottom of the spine, right in the middle of the body. And the breath comes into that core and then goes out from that core. You can think of it as a kind of a line of energy. See what that perception does. Or you can focus on a particularly difficult part of the body where you're holding tension in, where there seems to be a blockage. Focus directly on that, see what happens. Think about opening up, 
And the breath can come in from any direction at all, front, back, top, down, it's coming up from below. And see if that helps to open up the blockage. Sometimes the blockage may feel to be in one spot, but it's actually caused by a blockage in another spot. Check for that as well. And as you do this, you begin to see the impact of your perceptions. Perceptions are a kind of karma, the ones you choose to focus on. So many times we carry around perceptions that we're hardly aware of. We pick them up from this person or that, or from ideas we had from, from books we've read, people we've talked to, things we picked up on our own when we were little kids. The mind many times is like a house where you haven't moved out of that house ever since you were born. And you know what happens when you live in a house without ever moving? You never have to take stock of your possessions. So when you're meditating, it's like moving out of the house. Okay, what possessions here are really worth taking with us? Which ones are the ones you want to throw away or give to goodwill? And if you find the perceptions are hard to look at, as I said, Consciously come up with some new ones, intentionally come up with some new ones, and then try holding on to them and see how they affect the way you breathe. This way you get a better and better sense of the, the karma of your thoughts, the karma of your ideas. You can start seeing in other areas of your life as well. The chat we had just now on the, the turning of the wheel of Dharma. The most important part of that chat is actually the wheel in there. You may not have noticed it. It was the passage where we went through the Four Noble Truths and then the duties appropriate to each of them. Suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Its cessation is to be realized, and the path to that cessation is to be developed. These are the Buddha's shoulds. This is another set of ideas that you can carry around with you, particularly as you go out into the frenzy of the world. Because one of the crazy-making aspects of our modern culture is that we're exposed to a lot of shoulds all at once. People with political agendas have their shoulds. People with psychological agendas have their shoulds. Members of our family have their shoulds. And if you try to live by all the shoulds that are being imposed on you, you'd go crazy. You get pulled one direction or another. You get blown around by the ideas of the world. And some of their shoulds are humane and some of them are not. Some of them have your true happiness in mind, but a lot of them don't. This is why the, the Buddhist shoulds are so valuable, because they really are on your side. From the psychological point of view, they're the Buddhist version of the superego that tells you what you should do. He's saying basically that you should take the prop, should take the issue of your suffering really seriously. When you see that you're doing something that's causing suffering, okay, abandon it. First off, you've got to comprehend what is this suffering. All too often we run away from it. We try to cover it up, hide it, push it out, anything but actually sit and look at it. And this is one of the things that blows us around. Anytime we come near suffering, we try to run away. So in addition to the, the winds of the world blowing us around, we have our own fears that keep pushing us away, pushing us away. But if you're willing to sit and look at the stress you're feeling, look at the suffering you're feeling, with an attitude of curiosity, that helps make you resistant to a lot of worlds, resistant to a lot of winds, the shoulds of the world. So this is one way of withstanding outside pressure. Because that's the hook of a lot of influences coming from outside. They say, well, you want to be 
happy, you want to be a, get away from your sufferings and your pains and your miseries. Well, we'll show you how. Do it our way. And you're so ready to run away from your suffering that you just pick up with anybody who comes up with a suggestion. But if you can say, no, I'd rather sit and look at this for a while. then you're not so susceptible to their influences. But of course you need a skill. This is why we have the path. If it were nothing but suffering for you to look at all day in and out, you wouldn't last very long. This is why we work on developing concentration, keeping a center, maintaining that center inside. Always have that perception that you've got this quiet spot inside. that doesn't have to get involved with the suffering. You can stay in your quiet spot and watch the suffering. You can see it clearly. It's like there's a glass window, though, between you. Try to maintain that attitude all the time. This is why we work on the breath, to make it comfortable so you do have a place to go when suffering gets really bad and you get worn out trying to understand it or comprehend it and you just can't see where it's coming from. You can drop it for the time being and go back to the sense of ease that you can create working with the breath energy in the body. That's an important part of the Buddhist strategy, trying to maximize the pleasure that you can get simply from the process of breathing, so that you have your foundation. That way. You're in a much better position just to be able to sit and look at the suffering, look at the stress, to see how it comes, how it goes, how it comes back again. And then you can ask the question, what did I just do that made it come back again? Or when it goes, ask yourself, well, what, what did I just do just now? And begin to see what arises together with the suffering and what ceases as the suffering ceases. That's a lot of your clue right there as to what's actually causing it. And again, many times it's these elements of perception, attention, intention, the ideas you hold in your mind, the things that you focus on as important, and what you want to do as a result. So as you keep the Buddha's shoulds in mind, that changes the question of intention. You hold on to these as opposed to the shoulds of the world, and you find that life gets a lot easier. You're not so susceptible to outside influences. You're not so easily pushed around. When the winds of the world blow, they can sometimes just blow right through you, but you stay where you are. You're like a big screen on a window. The wind blows through the screen, and the screen may wobble a little bit, but it doesn't get blown around, because it allows these things to come through without trying to catch them, without trying to resist them. But secure enough that you know that you don't have to run with every influence that comes from outside, because you've got your set of shoulds that you know is more important than the shoulds that other people are imposing on you or your old ideas impose on you. So right view, or what the Buddha calls appropriate attention, is looking at things in terms of these Four Noble Truths and the duties that are appropriate to them. That's an important kind of karma. It's part of the karma that leads to the end of karma a set of ideas, a set of mental choices that lead to the end of having to have ideas and choices. In other words, they can ultimately deliver you, deliver you to true happiness. So when the ways of the world seem overwhelming, remind yourself you've got something that's more important than the world, that's more solidly based than the world. We talk about the real world as if it were the practice is unreal or the attitudes that the Buddha have has us follow are unreal. That's not the case at all. These are real. As for the world, 
we look what it's like. One day people have one set of attitudes, a little while later they change. And if you allowed yourself to take the, the axis of the world as the point where your compass points, it's not like the physical world. And the magnetic north does move a little bit on the physical world, but the magnetic north of the world of people's attitudes, that wobbles all over the place. The Buddha's magnetic north is, is even more steady and constant than the magnetic north of the physical world. It's just these things. There's suffering and you want to comprehend it. There's its cause and you want to abandon it. There's its cessation which you want to realize and there's a path to its cessation that you want to develop. Make sure that those are your values, those are your, your ideas, those are the ideals, those are the shoulds that you follow. They give you something solid to hold on to as the rest of the world blows around in whatever it's going to do. So the choice is yours. And always remember, you have that choice. That's what's so important about the Buddhist teachings on karma. It's strange that karma is one of those teachings that's really difficult to penetrate into the West. People like being independent, they like being able to shape their lives, but they don't like the idea that their actions have consequences. It's like children. They want to be free, but they don't want to have to pick up their messes. But if you realize that the fact that you do have these choices, this is what enables you to be free. The fact that there are consequences to your actions. If your actions didn't have consequences, there could be no freedom at all. It's simply a matter of learning how to work more skillfully with your thoughts and your words and your deeds, and especially your thoughts. So each time a thought comes into your mind that you feel tempted to focus on and develop, ask yourself, is this skillful? Remember, it has consequences. And remember, you have the choice to focus on the thoughts that have the best consequences. It may take time, it may take application of energy. After all, it's a skill that you have to work on. But the results are more than worth it, whatever effort that goes into it. The results go way beyond the effort. After all, the karma that leads to the end of karma opens you up to the deathless. The conditioned world, if you learn how to manipulate the conditions properly, open, opens you up to the unconditioned. So always hold that attitude in mind. <clears throat>